was a lot of fun leading up to Christian, but we're really excited um, to put a spotlight on Christian this morning and to just make sure everybody's up to speed with the kind of work he does. We're next going to share um, a 90 second clip of his, of his film work. All right, let's take a look at his reel and then we'll hear from Christian. Thank you so much, Christian, for being here this morning. Let's give a warm welcome to Christian Remdi here to talk to us about the intersection of creativity and stress. Christian. Uh, so my name is Christian Remdi, and I am a filmmaker uh, here in Austin, Texas. I've been working in the industry for almost 25 years in a lot of different positions. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about kind of how I got to where I am today. Uh, but before I get started, I just wanted to thank everybody for showing up. Um, I know the idea of adding a Zoom call, another Zoom call to my day, uh, fills me with a sort of existential dread. So I do appreciate everybody showing up. Um, and I also wanted to thank Eric Silverstein from the Peach Tortilla for letting us shoot in here today. Um, so I'm gonna start by saying that this is the first time I've ever given a talk like this. Um, I'm, usually, I'm usually that guy over there. I'm usually the guy behind the camera watching someone talk. Um, so when they told me that the theme for today was stress, I, I, I thought it was pretty appropriate because uh, this has been stressing me out for a couple weeks now. Um, so stress for me has always been sort of self-inflicted, um, but it's also been a thread that's run through a lot of my creative life. Um, I grew up wanting to make movies and specifically wanting to direct them. Uh, my first movie going experience was seeing Star Wars in 1977. And I remember that feeling of being transported and so just focused on what was going on on the screen. Uh, and after dragging my dad to see that movie over and over again, I decided that's really what I wanted to do with my life. Um, as a six year old, I actually thought they went out into space and made a movie, which sounded really cool to me. Um, and then later I learned about sound stages and special effects, um, but the, that love of movies really grabbed onto me and it didn't let go. So almost no one gets just to start off getting paid to direct films. Uh, there's almost always a path that leads to it. Um, for some, they come up through the camera department, they start off as a PA and a grip, and then a AC and a cinematographer. Uh, others start as a writer and they get tired of seeing people butcher their work, so they decide to direct it themselves. Um, but one of my heroes is David Lean, who directed Bridge on the River Kwai and uh, my favorite film, Lawrence of Arabia. Um, he started off as an editor and uh, had an incredible respect for what editors brought to his films. Uh, Lean said that being an editor was better than any film school because you get a front row seat to a director's triumphs and their mistakes, and you get to learn exactly what you need in order to make a scene and then an overall film work. Uh, so I chose editing as my path to becoming a director. Uh, my high school 
had made a deal with the local public access station to give them a building on campus uh, in exchange for teaching classes on video production. So in high school, I learned how to edit on tape to tape machines, which shows you how old I am. Uh, I studied the pacing and the tempo of my favorite scenes, and I, I read every book I could about editing theories. In the early 90s, I'd been using a very early version of Photoshop to do photo editing, and digital nonlinear editing systems had begun to find their place in smaller production companies' edit suites. Uh, I met the owner of a production company who was looking to upgrade and expand their business. So I pitched them the idea of bringing me on as their new editor and investing in a digital editing system. After some back and forth, they agreed, and just before Christmas, the new computer system was delivered. Uh, and here's where stress begins to be that thread in my creative life. Uh, digital editing systems back then were like crazy expensive, and the owner wanted to start capitalizing on it right away. So he booked my first editing job with a client right after New Year's. I had two weeks while everyone was out of the office uh, over the holidays to learn how to use this system. So for those two weeks, I lived in the office. I had a bunch of old footage they had shot and a manual as thick as a phone book. And I learned that system inside and out. I practiced editing techniques and styles. And when the client showed up on that first day, I was ready. Those two weeks of intense stress had totally paid off. So, Fast forward about 10 years to 2006, I had moved to New York City and I was an established editor and motion graphics artist who had worked for companies like Disney and Warner Brothers and Sony, uh, and I felt like I was finally ready to make my leap into directing. So I made a couple of short films that played the festival circuit and had some success. Uh, my first short film, The Wine Bar, got into over 50 film festivals, it won awards, and I was kind of hoping that it would help propel me into directing features but that didn't happen. I made a couple more, but I was never really able to find my way into the narrative filmmaking world. I got married in 2009, and in 2010, my wife and I moved to Austin. I was able to keep a lot of my post-production clients working remotely, but creatively, I was feeling really aimless. As I'd been directing my first short films, I realized that while I was really comfortable with the post-production side of filmmaking, uh, I wanted to learn more about the production side. Uh, at that time, DSLR cameras had started offering video, and you could use photo lenses with shallow depth of field, which totally changed the game. I bought the new Canon 7D and decided to teach myself how to shoot. I bought the camera at the end of the year, so my New Year's resolution was to make one short film every month in 2011. I would shoot all types of films, narratives, music videos, documentaries, anything I could think of that would make me more comfortable with a camera. I had to plan, shoot, and edit a film within the 30 or so days in every given month, and I felt incredibly cheated in February. I called it the 12 Films Project. I made a website for it and announced it to all of my friends and family and peers in the industry, thus ensuring that I actually had to do it. And that's where the stress set in once again. Making a short film is a lot of work, even in the best of situations, but having to plan, shoot, and edit one every month while working and having a life is incredibly stressful. I started out making a couple of narrative films since I already had some experience in that. I did a music video for some friend's new album, but my biggest hurdle was gonna be making a documentary because I had never ever worked on one before. When it came time to make the documentary, I chose my subject, Bryce Gilmore of Odd Duck, because I really admired what he was doing. I've always loved food and I always thought that if I hadn't gone into film, I probably would have gone to culinary school. So choosing a chef as the subject for my first documentary just felt right to me. Back when it was a food truck down on South Lamar, before there were high-rise apartments and high-end restaurants, Odd Duck was known for a hyper-local menu. Bryce would only cook what he could find at the farmer's market every Saturday, which meant that his menu was always changing, not only with the seasons, but week to week, depending on what the farmers and ranchers had brought with them. But even with that added stress, he was always able to make delicious and innovative dishes from a small and very hot trailer. I shot the documentary with Bryce elbow to elbow in that trailer, which was also home to a live fire grill that he made most of his dishes on. 
To be a fly on the wall while a chef I admired created new dishes right in front of me was exhilarating. The one thing I noticed while making my first documentary was an additional amount of pressure because I was telling the story of a real person, not a character in a film. It was, very, it was a very different kind of stress and I really wanted to get it right. There's a weird partnership that develops when you're making a documentary. Uh, I was the one shooting it and helping to craft the narrative, but the person you're shooting is more than just your subject. They're opening themselves up in some way and doing something that many of us don't normally do, which is talk very openly about themselves with a stranger, sort of like this. It's a symbiotic relationship with an incredible amount of give and take, even more than the relationship between a director and an actor. Learning how to develop that relationship and sustain that over uh, the course of the shoot was something I struggled with. Because I was used to, being, I was used to there being a script, but now I had to let things happen naturally and make sure I captured it in real time. As I was finishing the documentary, Bryce was awarded Food & Wine Magazine's Best New Chef, and suddenly people were really interested in the story I was telling. The documentary got picked up by Food & Wine Magazine, as well as other outlets, and suddenly I was sort of a documentary filmmaker. I had enjoyed making a culinary, culinary documentary so much that I decided to make another, this time about Larry and Leanne Kusurik who had a charcuterie company here in Austin. I love charcuterie and love theirs in particular. And so I asked them to be the voice of the documentary. It focused on the history, but also on what it was like to use century old techniques today. Once again, I got extremely lucky with the timing of the release. Charcuterie had become a very popular subject in the culinary world. And the documentary got picked up by culinary outlets and even some mainstream media like the Huffington Post and the New York Times. I decided to finish up the documentary side of the 12 Films Project with sort of a sequel to the Bryce Gilmore documentary. The local food movement was in full swing in Austin and the rest of the country, and there were a lot of talented chefs embracing the eat local ethos. This was the film that almost killed me. Up till then, I had been making a short film every month, but I had been keeping them all very small and manageable. Local, which is what I called this doc, ended up being a sprawling 30-minute film with multiple storylines, over 15 different interviews shot in restaurants all around Austin and farms and ranches in the surrounding areas. For that entire month, every single day, even my birthday and Thanksgiving, I was either shooting or editing, and I released it at 10 p.m. on November 30th just barely making the deadline. That was the film that made me the food documentary guy. It played film festivals and got me the attention of major food brands, restaurants, and even the culinary travel market. It was, a weird, it was weird because I had always pictured myself being a narrative filmmaker and I've been working towards that my whole life. But I finally decided that I was still getting to make films for a living, which was more than so many others get to do. So I embraced my new calling. I started a company with my wife, Julie, and spent the next eight years traveling the world, shooting with everyone from Michelin star geniuses to the most talented street food chefs you've never heard of. But along the way, I stopped feeling that stress. The job got easier as I went along and the projects I was working on were incredibly fun and challenging, but the stakes were never as high as when I was doing something personal. I settled into a comfortable existence and kind of coasted for a while. There was a very different kind of stress then, more about the hustle of finding your next job uh, or making clients happy. My wife and I also had a daughter, Lucy, which added so much joy and even a little stress to my life sometimes. Like virtually everyone in the industry, when the pandemic hit this year, all my work dried up. I had just finished shooting a series of branded content pieces when the stay-at-home order was issued, and I was lucky to have post-production to keep me busy for a little while. But once that was finished, I felt incredibly aimless. I would talk with friends in the restaurant industry about what was happening to them and tried to help where I could, but I felt helpless. When the government said restaurants could reopen, I started talking to friends who were planning on bringing people back into their dining rooms, and I decided I would begin to document it, not really having a clear idea of what the end product would be. I shot with one restaurant and then another and another, and it slowly dawned on me that it could be a series. 
The hospitality industry is built on giving the consumer the best experience possible. And everyone is trained to put on a smile and make sure the customers feel welcome and leave satisfied. Because of that, when the public walks into a restaurant or has a drink on the patio or even picks up curbside, they won't see the stress, the worry, and sometimes desperation that these people are feeling. My goal was to give them a safe space to talk about uh, what they were going through. So maybe people would see it and tip a little more or order curbside one extra night a week if they could, or even go on a restaurant's website and buy a gift card just to put some extra cash into their registers. Restaurants are so much more than a place for people to eat. They are where we have first dates, celebrate birthdays and anniversaries, or just sit comfortably with old friends and talk. If that industry is diminished, our ability to have those experiences and make those memories will be diminished with it. I launch new episodes every Tuesday morning, and every Monday night, that stress comes back. Telling these stories is an immense privilege, and everyone I've interviewed has been incredibly open and honest about the industry and their own personal experience. These stories are full of heroes who are trying to save their staff, their businesses, and themselves every day and having to put on a happy face while they do it. And I feel like I owe it to them to make every story resonate. Having that familiar stress come back to me made me feel like I was working on something that had real value again. Originally, I started this as a small, short documentary idea. And as it grew, I thought I would make three episodes, and that grew to six or seven. And now as I've started releasing them, uh, more and more chefs have, and owners have contacted me with their stories, and I've shot 11 of them so far. And I'm flying to Washington, D.C. on Monday to shoot another one. I think I'm going to continue to ride that wave of stress and keep telling these important stories for as long as I can, because at least for me, stress is a good indicator that I'm doing the right thing. I just got stressed out thinking about you going on a plane to DC, so. <laughs> that is very stressful, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, what we wanna do is, if it's okay by you, open up the floor for some questions. I, I would ask you, I think we, we've talked about a bunch of stuff, Christian, uh, in our conversations leading up to this. Um, I think some of the more interesting um, things that you've brought up for me is just how this is an industry with, I'm speaking specifically about reopen where um, people don't necessarily get to see the stress related to it unless you've worked it because the whole job is about putting a front on so that everyone basically has a good time for themselves. Is there anything in your own work where you feel that too? You're always behind the lens. You're, you're not necessarily out in front. This is you, you talked to me about coming out in front and how that feels different for you now. Do, do you feel a kinship with uh, the restaurateurs uh, that you've been interviewing uh, right now for that reason? Absolutely. I think um, when you are on the other side of the camera, you want people to feel, you want the, the, the people on, the, on this side of the camera to feel comfortable. That's such a huge part of what you're doing. Um, and it's, it's a little bit different because uh, in the hospitality industry, you kind of want people to have that experience and you're just sort of on the periphery, just sort of helping them have that experience. Whereas um, when you're doing a documentary, you're, you're, sometimes you're guiding people through that experience, through being comfortable and opening up and talking about things. Um, and sometimes you get really lucky and there's people who can just sit down and turn it on and go for it and you really don't have to do very much. But um, a lot of times you're interviewing people who aren't used to being in front of a camera and you know when you've got multiple lenses on you and you know you feel that pressure of a microphone and all of that like it can be i mean I, i'm feeling it right now so um you know i think uh i think part of what I, part of your job on the other side of the camera is is making people feel comfortable and welcomed and and willing to share and willing to open themselves up so absolutely i i do feel that uh that kinship with with the people in the service industry. Uh, it looks like uh, Maria has a question. Hello. Hi, Maria. Okay. Here, we can hear you. Cool. Um, thanks for that talk. Uh, it really made me excited to want to dine out again in Austin, which I haven't been doing. Um, 
And it's, I, I watched a couple of the shorts and just the integrity of keeping staff safe and honoring the food has been really inspiring to me. Um, my question is maybe because I'm in the creative community and here we are talking about um, creative grants and things like that in this channel, have there been city or otherwise efforts to help keep restaurants open, um, food related grants, either for restaurants or farmers or anything else? Have you guys gotten any kind of helpful bailout? No, unfortunately there really hasn't. Uh, I think that um, all of the, all of the restaurateurs, the chefs, the owners that I've spoken to um, were really disappointed that Congress went on vacation during all of this. Um, and there's just, there really hasn't been much relief. No, unfortunately. I think one of the episodes we watched, um, one, one owner mentioned applying for, what was it the PPE loan or I'm, I'm probably getting the acronym wrong. So I think the access has been the same as all small businesses up to this point, right? Yes, there are PPP loans and stuff like that. Um, but the, um, but there hasn't been anything specific for the restaurant industry. And I think the, the, the issue for, for a lot of these restaurants is that restaurants were really singled out initially um, during the early days of all of this. Kind of one of the first messages that was put out was don't go to restaurants. Um, and I think that really hurt the industry right away. It just was like, you know, people were still going on cruise ships and going to water parks. But... They said, don't go to restaurants. Um, the other issue is, is that um, restaurants are the only small business that you uh, have to take your mask off in order to uh, use. You know, if, you, if you're gonna eat or you're gonna drink, you have to take your mask off. You go to a bookstore or a shoe store or something like that, um, you can leave your mask on the whole time and it's, it's not an issue. Um, and so uh, I, think, I think restaurants were have been hit harder maybe than a lot of other small businesses. Certainly all small businesses are struggling right now. Um, but restaurants were hit very, very hard. And, uh, and it's an industry that employs just a huge amount of people. And so uh, I, th I think that the industry is, has a, uh, an expectation, and I think a, a right to have that expectation that they would get uh, some kind of help, additional help, um, but that hasn't come. Uh, so Laura asked a great question. We've talked about this. I think everyone would love to know the answer. So um, maybe not everyone knows this. This was a self-directed project. You were camera, you were sound, you were the interviewer, uh, you were the post-production, you were the marketer. This whole reopen project was you. Uh, so Laura is asking, uh, is it now, quote, paying off for you? Are you able to sell it as a series? Um no, um, it really isn't. I, I, um, we, so we were talking about this last night during the screening, but um, we had, I, I, I really didn't have a, a game plan for this. This was just, you know, I had a lot of free time and wanted to give back in some way to an industry that's been incredibly supportive of me over the years. And so I really just decided I was just going to start doing this. And so I made the first three, uh, the first three episodes and a friend of mine who has a marketing agency was like, Hey, would you want to try to get, um, sponsorship for this or find a platform for it? And I said, sure. You know, I, I really hadn't planned on it. And so, um, we sent it out and we talked to a lot of different culinary brands and platforms. Um, but we could just never really find one. We could never find someone who, um, I think was willing to give up control of, um, the content. Uh, and I think that so many platforms and brands right now are looking at things as content and not just, this felt more like news in a way. Um, it's, you know, and it doesn't always put on a happy face and, you know, people are talking about very real things in it. Uh, and I feel like the brands really, um, kind of wanted something that felt a little bit, uh, more hopeful. And unfortunately, there isn't a lot of hope in these episodes. Um, and that's not to say that they're not, they're, there are some very funny moments and there are, I mean, chefs are great storytellers and they're, you know, they're incredibly 
generous with their emotions and very open. And so you fee- you really get to see what's going on. But I think that that maybe it was a little too real for a lot of uh, a lot of the brands that we were talking to. So um, I'm just going to make them. I'm going to make them and put them out. And, you know, that's my thing. Matt, you've had your hand raised, so I want to go to you and get, you have a chance to ask a question. Thank you for your questions, Laura and Maria. Uh, let's go to Matt. Christian, thank you first of all for, for showing up uh, and giving us your story. I, I can definitely align with you of being one to, that prefers to be on the other end of the camera instead of yeah. in front of it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I prefer doing like the post-production stuff of everything. Um, so I had a question that I wrote down that I was kind of curious about. You know, you st- said from a young age that you had started off with that passion of wanting to do like big feature film kind of production and directing and, and doing that kind of thing. And at some point uh, you had kind of shifted to this more documentary kind of approach to filmmaking. Uh, and I'm sure that was like a really kind of stressful thing for you to, to questioning whether you're uh, embracing it or kind of just settling for what you had at the time. And eventually it, you know, you said that you did embrace it and have obviously kind of gone on with that. So I was just kind of wondering, like, at that point when you were like thinking, is this something that I'm going to do for the rest of my life? Is this something that I want to do? That kind of stress factor and, and, and how you kind of overcame that, because uh, I'm kind of in a similar situation right now of, of deciding, you know, uh, getting more into motion graphics. You know, I want to be more of a MoGraph kind of person. Um, but there's kind of that risk and that fear and that stress of, I don't know if this is going to work out for me or not. So yeah. I'm kind of curious as to how you overcame some of that stress and, and uh, fears. So I think that, I think for me, um, th- it was, it was a difficult moment in, in my life. And it was a tough kind of four or five months where I was sort of making that decision of saying like, oh, okay, maybe I'm not going to make narrative films, maybe I am going to be making documentaries. Um, I think what really helped me overcome that stress was the idea that I would be making, that I would be focusing on uh, food. Um, Because I love food so much and I've always loved that world and I've always loved chefs and I've always loved restaurants and um, I just, I felt like, okay, well, you know, if I'm going to make documentaries, then I'm going to make them about something that I'm very passionate about. And that really helped me uh, overcome the idea that I wasn't going to be doing narratives, which is, I mean, I, I mean, from a very, I mean, that was always what I was just going to do with my life. So I think being able to take the passion I had for narrative filmmaking and apply it, apply that passion to something in the documentary world was what helped me make that transition a lot smoother. Great, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. All right. So we, we are about to close things out. I have one more question um, that I will share because I think uh, it it came from Ann who I think had, uh, had to drop off. She messaged me. Um, So I want to read it to you and uh, we'll, we'll close on this one. Um, it sounds like the monthly project was also self-directed, uh, the one where you did one every month. Yeah. Um, how did you nudge yourself on the days when you didn't feel inspired to work on those self-directed projects? No external force. What What was the nudge you gave yourself? Um, I think the, the thing that always kept me going um, was... I think it was it was a couple of things. I think getting excited about the next month's project helped me want to finish the one that I was working on uh, on the days when I didn't want to get out of bed or whatever it was. Um, but also, um, I think that, I, and I said it in the speech a little bit too, was was when I sort of when you announce and I, when you just tell everybody I'm going to do this. Then there's that, then there is that pressure of like, you know what, I have to, I have to, there has to be that follow through. And so when, because you never want to kind of start a project and get halfway through it and not finish it. And I've done that before and it's a terrible feeling. And so I really, um, I really just wanted to, to continue doing it. And, uh, and so, yeah, telling everybody, Hey, I'm doing this and, uh, setting up that expectation that there was going to be a short film every month. 
Uh, and it's not like it had a huge audience, uh, but it just, you know, even just having your friends and family being like, hey, when's the next film coming out or whatever, it, it just kind of provides that little bit of push that you need in order to finish it up. I think that's great. Creating accountability where there is none. Uh, yeah. Is doing that. That's really great. Um, well, Christian, thank you so much for spending uh, your time this morning with us. Uh, really appreciate your story and the work that you're doing. Everyone should go check out Reopen. Uh, you can do so now, and then you can follow along as Christian adds more episodes. We'll see. Maybe he'll throw a Patreon on the page, and you can contribute that way, too. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, yeah, we can talk. Well, let's talk about that afterwards, Christian. Uh, oh. I, can, I can tell you about our experience doing that. Um, but to everyone who's here, thank you so much for being a part of Creative Mornings. Um, thank you for being a part of the creative community here in Austin. Uh, we love y'all. We want you to, um, we hope that this has been inspiring for you on some level. And just before we go, this is a, this whole thing happens because of volunteer organizers. So I want to thank today our director, who's Kim Tidwell. Our uh, AD today was Kaylee Caulfield, um, managing the chat and uh, putting in lots of uh, fun stuff into the chat was Ann Walker. Um, our prize patrol today, who you saw was Robin, who was joined with by Rosie, uh, delivering food to Dave. And then, of course, our co-founder and our co-host this morning, Brian Thompson. On behalf of all of us at Creative Mornings, uh, we wish you a very happy Friday. And until we see you again, y'all stay weird and, and we love y'all. Have a creative morning, everybody. Cheers. <laughs>